Um, what happened after the war is that the stories of the children were really repressed. And not necessarily only by them, but also by, by society at large. The, the children were seen as survivors of the war, and that's it. They weren't seen as having suffered anything. But just over five thousand, half of the children in Belgium were deported, and half were saved. About five thousand were saved. That was the big thing. That that everything, the deportations were done uh, under the guise of deportations for labor in the East. That made it, you know, seem not so. Uh, it, it, they knew it was going to be terrible, but at least you could, by working, you could save yourself. Nobody talked about extermination. It was amazing how the Germans succeeded, in effect, in hiding the question of extermination. Uh, some were saved by, the, by networks of priests, especially in the south of the country. Uh, that is one way in which children were hit. People got in touch with the resistance, and the resistance came, the escorts came, took the children from the parents, and brought them to designated places. Escorts were all women. Uh, it would have been hard to trust men uh, in, in that. Now, the other way in which children were hidden was if parents approached the convent or the parish priest individually. Um, I think there are two main motivations. Uh, one is the possibility of converting, uh, converting lost souls to Catholicism. The second one is really humanitarian. And today it is impossible to disentangle the two motivations. The adaptation differed, but uh, depending also on the convent, on how tolerant the convent was. Uh, for instance, in the question of conversion, if, if the, there were convents that wanted to baptize at all costs and convents that didn't, that didn't force the children. Some children who, who really found consolation in the, in the Catholic religion, if, for instance, they replaced their mother by the Virgin Mary, and they prayed to the Virgin Mary uh, for, the, for their parents. Uh, so the, the adaptation was uh, quite, quite remarkable. Uh, the children were in the convent under the impression that their parents were coming back. In one convent, for instance, the mother superior did not tell many sisters that, that they were Jewish children. She would tell them that they were Protestant children. For instance, and they could not go to, to confession and to communion. Uh, and in, in other convents, uh, all the nuns knew. So it all, it, it, these are all individual stories. We can... My name's Paulette Wren Dorflaffer, but first it was Corsia, and then it became Paulette Wren Wolf. And my family was from Spain, and then they went to Oran, Algeria. And then from there, they went to Marseille, France. One of the strongest memories I have of my childhood was when I arrived here at four years old. A couple of months later, I'm walking with my mother, and we're in South Orange, and we're by Seton Hall. And, and all of a sudden, these three nuns are coming at me. I let go of my mother's hand, and I run to the nuns, and I hold on to their legs, and they're patting me on my head. Of course, they don't know what happened. And my mother's yelling, Paulette, come back, come back. And then she comes, and she explains to them how wonderful they were to me when I was in the hospital. When I came to this country, my parents told me I'm Jewish, I'm from France, and I didn't have any more family. Then when I turned 21, my father said, we have to go to the French Embassy. In 1971, we'll call the French Embassy. I couldn't believe it. I go, what? I have family after 26 years. I couldn't believe it. A brother and two sisters. 1972. I went to France in February, and I arrived Febu February 9th, the day I arrived to America. And I said, hey, I don't know if I'm going to recognize them or not. It was very meaningful meet meeting the family.